Oh. Oh, good lord. Why is this car so much fun to drive? Seriously, I absolutely adore this car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. GM parts bin interior. Cadillac user experience. Tiny rear seat. Whatever, I don't care. This car has no business driving this good. Holy crap, Cadillac. You really took it to the Germans here. The only E93 series I've driven was an M3, so yeah. Honestly, in the grand scheme of things, apples and oranges there. But I've covered a W204C30 mid-level car like this, and it was a pleasant experience. This. This, though. Cadillac knew they were lacking in the build quality department. They knew they had to step it up in other places. And, oh boy, they did. Do not take these words lightly when I say, I want to buy one of these cars now. They're that damn good on the road. The 2013 Cadillac ATS 2.0T performance is that good. Okay, so Cadillac had never really produced a competitive small car before. And when I say that, it's because their two previous attempts at a small premium car were half-hearted attempts at best. The first was the Cimarron of the early 1980s. You know, the rebadged Chevrolet Cavalier that was laughed all the way to Germany and back. Their next attempt was never even sold in America or Canada. And that was probably for the best, as it was just as shameless as the Cimarron. GM vice chairman at the time, Bob Lutz, was a supporter of Badge Engineer, and saw the potential of selling a small Cadillac in Europe and other markets via essentially rebadging a Saab 9.3 as the Cadillac BLS. The Saab 9.3 is a fine premium-ish car, but is far from the level of premium you would expect out of a Cadillac. So yeah, it was not taken well either and it was often jokingly called the Bob Lutz Special, instead of what Cadillac insisted the name stood for, the B-segment luxury sedan. Flash forward to the mid-aughts. Cadillac had introduced the CTS as its new, sportyish entry-level car. The CTS would fill the gap as Cadillac's entry-level mid-sized car slotted underneath the STS and replacing the failed Katera. Now, the trick with the CTS was that it was rear-wheel drive like the Katera, and Cadillac would aim it as more of a sports sedan than a luxury model like its larger siblings. Cadillac and GM hoped that by introducing something similar in size of a BMW's 5 Series or Mercedes-Benz E-Class, while offering at the price of a 3 Series or C-Class, the buyers of those smaller cars would jump to the larger Cadillac. They did not. Even though Cadillac had introduced a performance letter model known as the CTS-V, aimed squarely at the M3 and M5. Cadillac would take note of this, and soon would work on a smaller, proper 3 Series fighter. Knowing that the second-gen CTS Sigma platform would be too heavy for what would become the ATS, Cadillac engineers began work on a smaller, lighter platform. They also determined that utilizing a front-wheel drive platform would also hurt the brand image and not provide the desired performance. So, rear-wheel drive it would be. The platform had to be able to accommodate an optional all-wheel drive, and 50-50 weight distribution would be the intended goal. And to top it all off, Chief Engineer Dave Mash would use the E46 BMW 3 Series, arguably the greatest of all BMW 3 Series, as the benchmark for Cadillac's new small car. Mash also had his team disregard several GM product development rules because those old habits would have resulted in a heavier car. This car in particular has a curb weight of 3,358 pounds, which is really impressive considering that this is Cadillac of all cars we're talking about. The result is what you see here today, the Cadillac ATS. They couldn't have picked a better benchmark than the E46 3 Series, as this car is an absolute hoot even in this mid-level 2.0T performance trim. The 2.0-liter Ecotec LTG Turbo 4 puts out a very respectable 272 horsepower and 260 foot-pounds of torque, 
Refreshed models got the same horsepower, but torque would be bumped up to 295 foot-pounds. The base engine was the naturally aspirated 2-liter, but up from the Turbo 4 gets you the 3.5-liter high-feature LFX V6 that was co-developed with Holden. And given the V put twin turbos on the V6 that produced a fantastic 464 horsepower and 445 foot-pounds of torque. Pre-refresh models got the 6-speed 4L45 Hydromatic with the variable manual mode with paddle shifters like on this performance model, while refresh ones got the 8-speed and a stick Tremec 6-speed manual was available on every version but the base, non-turbo 4. All-wheel drive was available, and you can get the ATS in either the four-door sedan that you see here today, or the very handsome coupe that toned down a lot of the second-gen CTS coupe styling decisions. Once again, I will sing the praises of Cadillac's engineering department with this car, as they designed a car that should not be this fun to drive. The Turbo 4 is a really peppy engine, and it wastes no time slamming the power to the rear wheels. Keep in mind that 272 horsepower is approaching Ford Focus RS territory, all while sending power to the rear wheels in a package that's over 100 pounds lighter. Fear not, the 2.0T performance will waste no time in spinning those rear wheels. And here's the thing, while it's easy to spin those rear wheels, it's not at all a scary car to drive on the edge. The couple of times I let loose around corners and spun the rear wheels, it quickly found the grip to send me in the proper direction, like it just cracks just perfectly. I cannot sing the praises of this car highly enough, and I sound like a broken record. I legit want to buy one of these now, and I'm honestly very interested in one of these as a potential replacement as the next Wookiee Mobile when I finally upgrade from Malibu Stacy. Honestly, my only gripes with the car, I can live with. And it's all the GM parts bin interior. This is legit the same headliner and such that's in my 2019 Malibu. Most of the plastic switch gears carry over from cheaper Chevrolets. This is honestly expected on modern Cadillacs, and it's something you'd not only accept because the car itself drives so damn well. You have some uniquely Cadillac and ATS stuff, though. These seats were and are among the thinnest you could find in a GM product at the time, and this was to maximize interior space and weight. You get Cadillac Q, which was notably terrible and laggy, even when new. But the HVAC and radio controls operate via these haptic controls that I really don't trust over traditional buttons, but hey, they do light up and buzz a little when you touch them. The entertainment stack lifts up to reveal a storage bin underneath that includes a USB port, a bin ATS owners have affectionately referred to as the Batcave. As expected from a now 9-year-old luxury car, the Batcave is finicky and is sometimes known to fail altogether, but yeah, this one does work. But yeah, the ATS's interior isn't a deal breaker for me. This was Cadillac's entry level offering, so it isn't as offensive to me as a second gen CTS's interior was. Honestly, a lot of the parts bin stuff is from a lot of very recent GM products like my own 2019 Malibu. And that in itself makes this 2013 car's interior feel a little more modern than it actually is. Just don't touch Q. But I'll beat on this dead horse. This car's performance truly outpunches one's expectations. And this isn't even the V. The balance is just perfect with the current power, and I honestly was not expecting that. This particular car is owned by a familiar face to the channel, as this car belongs to Brian of Carolina Roots Photography, the same owner of the Yukondo GMC Yukon from episode 79. At the time of filming that truck, this ATS, which is his daily, was sitting in his garage with a cracked radiator. That radiator has been the only mechanical issue he's had with the Cadillac, and he even replaced it in his garage at home on a free weekend of his. He bought this car in 2016 for around $22,000 with a touch over 13,800 miles on it. The ATS now has over 82,000 miles on it, and, like the Yukondo, it's been all over the eastern United States on all sorts of automotive adventures. The biggest adventure was following much of the 2019 Hot Rod Power Tour, and even autocrossing the ATS at Kentucky Speedway that year. The car has also made trips to the Tail of the Dragon, and has easily been his proudest car purchase. 
Brian did have a minor fender bender when he hydroplaned in a terrible rainstorm on I-4085, but luckily the only damage was tearing the rear bumper cover and tailpipes off. But the absolute fun of the ATS has made it a fantastic daily for him. And when it is finally time for him to replace it as a daily, he does plan on keeping it. Turns out these things take Ellis swaps with minimum fabrication, so that's a potential route for him when it finally comes time to throw the kitchen sink at it. But as it sits, this ATS performance has no problem putting a smile on his face when commuting to work or leaving a local meet. The 2013 Cadillac ATS 2.0T performance has no right driving this well. Cadillac far, far outpunched its weight class with just how good and balanced this car drives. It's not an ATS V, but the 272 horsepower just feels like the correct amount of power for this car. The Turbo 4 has no problem spinning the rear wheels, and the chassis and steering tuning are so perfect that you'd have to be an idiot to end up recreating a Cars and Coffee Mustang video with this car. Like I mentioned earlier, this car impressed me so much that I seriously put this car into my mental cars I would like to own list the day I drove it. I don't think I've had this much fun in a car since I drove the E92 M3 last fall, and that car is a freaking M car. This ATS performance at least seems like an attainable goal for a poor sap like me, unlike the potential nightmare engine situation that a E92 M3 might face. I leave a lot of wiki drives thoroughly enjoying my short experience with cars, but rarely do I sit down when I get home from a drive and say, I want that car. 2013 Cadillac ATS 2.0T Performance A car so good that a Wookiee desperately wants to buy one. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you once again for watching another episode of Wookie Drives. Once again, huge shout out to Brian of Pineville, North Carolina for letting me enjoy his Cadillac ATS. Brian is a part-time motorsports photographer, and check out his work following his Instagram page at Carolina Roots Photography. Also check out his Twitter at NC Gearhead to follow his several projects, including the Yukondo you saw in episode 79 of Wookie Drives. If you have a car truck you'd like to see on the show and happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, feel free to email me at wikidrives at gmail.com. That's right, submit your car to wikidrives at gmail.com. That's wikidrives at gmail.com. And finally, don't forget to hit that like button, share a comment with some feedback. Any feedback's good feedback, and any sort of interaction with my videos really help this channel in the algorithm. Don't forget to share with all your Cadillac ATS friends. And finally, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and hit that bell for more Wookiee Drives like these. Thank you so much for watching and have a good day. They call it the Green Hell, a brutal stretch of asphalt in the German countryside designed to push the limits of car and driver. It's where we developed the all new Cadillac ATS built from the ground up to take on the BMW 3 Series. So if anyone tells you that Cadillac can't beat the world's best, just tell them to go to green hell and see for themselves.